Good morning. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and we welcome our in-person audience and our some seven to 800 who are joining us remotely today to our conference whose theme is Ambassadors, Warriors, and Attaches, the Role of the Military in Diplomacy. We give our deep thanks to the William M. Wood Foundation for their generous contribution, which has made this series possible. And now I'd like to ask all who are with us in person today to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This is the 10th year that the Naval Institute has partnered with the U.S. Naval Academy to host a conference, an applied history conference, to discuss an important topic, its place in history, the current situation, and the implications for the future. And each year, we strive to choose a topic, and it's kind of tricky to do this six to eight months in advance, but choose a topic that's important. And like beginning last winter, we put together this conference and are able to bring you this stellar lineup of speakers today. Recent events in Afghanistan make this topic more important and more interesting. Today, you'll hear from a member of a provincial re reconstruction team, a leader of a PRT, um, a member of a cultural support team, and these are all critical components of the military's contribution and operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. In addition, we have three former ambassadors and the former Secretary of Defense and the current attache to Beijing here with us today. Some of our participants are here and some of them are remote. We're going to delve into the history of diplomacy with our opening keynote, we'll look at the partnership between the military and the State Department. Over lunch, we'll hear from former Secretary Panetta, after which we'll discuss the importance of the military's work in humanitarian efforts in the rule of law and the importance contribution to the U.S. international image. We've had the pleasure of working very closely with a couple of folks at the Naval Academy, Lieutenant Marissa Cruz Lamar, instructor in the English department, and Commander Rene Laverde, who's a professor in the political science department. Additionally, we've had the support of the Naval Academy Allies Club, in particular, I'd like to cite Midshipman Caroline Finley. We extend our most special welcome to the Midshipmen many of whom are providing escorts today and introductions, and the Naval Academy faculty who are with us. Just four years ago, Naval Institute life member, General Colin Powell, was on this stage participating in a conference just like this. And I feel like today we can't discuss the important intersection between the military and diplomacy without acknowledging his immense contribution to the nation. He will be sorely missed. It's now my pleasure to introduce Superintendent of the Naval Academy, Vice Admiral Sean Buck, a native of Indianapolis. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy and was designated a Naval Flight Officer. He commanded all the forward maritime patrol reconnaissance assets in the 5th and 7th fleets. He was the Chief of Staff, Strategy Plans and Policy on the Joint Staff J-5, and most recently served as the Commander, Naval Forces Southern Command and Commander of the Fourth Fleet. He's no stranger to diplomacy. He has a Master's in International Security Policy from George Washington University, and he's completed an Executive Certificate Program in Foreign Politics, International Relations, and National Interest at both the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Graduate School of Education. 
let's welcome the 63rd Superintendent of Midshipmen, Vice Admiral Sean Buck. Admiral Daly, distinguished speakers, panelists, and guests who are all joining either in person or virtually for the annual United States Naval Institute's History Conference, good morning. Good morning from Annapolis, Maryland. On behalf of your United States Naval Academy, I'm thrilled to be able to once again host conferences on the yard and welcome diverse audiences of scholars, military personnel, and interested citizens to discuss topics of very critical importance. The Naval Academy is at its best when we are leveraging our location, our people, and our partnerships with organizations like the Naval Institute to bring bright minds together to discuss timely and important issues facing our Naval service and our nation. As Admiral Daly mentioned, the theme this year is incredibly prescient and one that's near to my heart. Throughout my career, especially as a flag officer, I served alongside allies and partners from many continents. As military personnel, whether or not we uh, wear the hat of an attache or a foreign airing officer, we all must be prepared to serve as a competent ambassador for our nation in times of peace and in times of war. This is why it is a Naval Academy priority to prepare our midshipmen during their four-year journey to one day effectively serve on and lead teams with our allies and our partners in the fleet. In our increasingly interconnected world, they must start their careers with intercultural competency. Admiral Daly, I'd like to thank you and the Naval Institute for bringing this premier event to the yard once again and for all that you do for the mission of our Naval Academy and our sea services all year long. Thank you. Without further ado, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Nicholas J. Cull. Dr. Cull is a well-known historian of public diplomacy and media. He is a professor of public diplomacy at the USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism where he is a fellow of both the Center for Communication Leadership and the Center on Public Diplomacy. He's originally from the UK, where he earned a BA and a PhD from the University of Leeds. He also studied at Princeton as a Harkness Fellow of the Commonwealth Fund of New York. He taught at Birmingham University and at the University of Leicester, where he launched the Center on American Studies. Moving to USC in 2005, Dr. Cull was the founding director of the master's program in public diplomacy and part of the team recognized by the Department of State with the Benjamin Franklin Award. For many years, he served as president of the International Association for Media and History. He has provided advice and training in public diplomacy to a number of foreign ministries and cultural agencies around the world, including those of the US, UK, Canada, Mexico, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. His work with the Department of Defense has included regular lectures at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey and to the Defense Information School and participation in multiple projects looking to better understand the soft power public affairs in, in the digital age. This is Dr. Cull's first visit to Annapolis. He is co-host of a podcast of international reputation called People, Places, Power. His many books include two volumes on the history of the United States Information Agency and Public Diplomacy, Foundations for Global Engagement in the Digital Age. Welcome to Annapolis, Professor Cole. We look forward to your remarks this morning. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm just looking for my. Uh, I'm speaking today not on on the role of 
the military as a diplomat in the sense of the work of um, military people who go on to be ambassadors or play a role, uh, like Secretary Powell as Secretary of State, or um, the um, uh, role of uh, military and negotiations or any of those formal diplomatic tasks. I'm looking specifically at the role of the US military in public diplomacy and uh, what I call reputational security. And I'll explain that concept of reputational security as I go. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, I'll talk about what public diplomacy is so that you're uh, clear on, on my definition. I'll talk about the overlap of the United States with the core mission of public diplomacy, and then I'll move on to some historical cases of, uh, mil of a military role in public diplomacy. Then I want to unpack what I see right now as our moment of crisis. And I think that uh, Peter's preface to this event has already underlined the extent to which we are at a critical juncture in this whole um, question of uh, diplomacy and management of world affairs. And I want to link the situation today to this concept of reputational security. And um, the bottom line is that I want to show um, that it is relevant to uh, the future career of every midshipman uh, at An Annapolis and uh, unpack this question, what does it mean to me? I think it necessarily is going to mean quite a lot. So, uh, quite a lot there, uh, but let's begin with the scope of public diplomacy. I define public diplomacy as conducting foreign policy through a process of public engagement. And uh, I think public diplomacy can be conducted by any uh, international actor. You don't necessarily have to be uh, affiliated with a particular nation state. The processes of public diplomacy include listening, that is engaging uh, a, a foreign public by collecting information from that public and feeding it into your own uh, policy processes. Advocacy, going out and explaining your um, uh, policies to that public in the most appealing way you can uh, uh, muster. Thirdly, cultural work, engaging a foreign public either through the export of some aspect of your culture or meeting them, engaging them in the cultural sphere. And uh, exchange diplomacy, so arranging opportunities for uh, mutual learning or life experiences and uh, engaging the foreign public that way. And my, my final element of public diplomacy would be uh, facilitating the export of, uh, of news, uh, which in the 20, 20th century has been, was done through international broadcasting. I think together these uh, elements are part of the overall soft power of a country. They have been one of the ways in which countries have sought to build their soft power. Uh, I think that uh, public diplomacy has been primarily a civilian category, but this does not mean that the military hasn't been present, because uh, I think that uh, the military is part of the interface between the United States government and the world. It might even be the primary interface uh, in many situations, and also it has had a budget that has enabled it to do more and more experimental things than the Department of State in a lot of instances. So, we're in the situation where, as the image on the screen suggests, where the rubber hits the road in public diplomacy, often it is the US military which is the, uh, the point of contact. So, this business of overlap. Uh, among the elements of overlap between military activity and public diplomacy, well, we can start with listening. 
where there's an important military role in uh, collecting intelligence, including intelligence about currents of public opinion. Secondly, in advocacy, State Department public diplomacy has long uh, enjoyed being able to be assisted by um, uh, Department of Defense MISO programs uh, where uh, military communications uh, personnel and technologies are available to uh, embassy teams. Thirdly, um, culture. There's a long tradition of military um, bands, uh, being informal ambassadors for the uh, United States. The uh, image on the screen there is a, um, from the front of some sheet music, um, uh, uh, music written uh, by and for uh, uh, Jim Europe, uh, who was a um, uh, leader of the uh, 369th Infantry Band, um, uh, which toured France uh, during the uh, First World War and were a great um, cultural asset to the United States government. They, it said they introduced ragtime music to French popular culture and uh, were um, a wonderful part of American public diplomacy. Today, of course, you uh, know about the military's relationship uh, with Hollywood, uh, which you can also see as cultural outreach um, a role in uh, um, US cultural outreach. Uh, fourthly, exchanges. Uh, military to military exchanges are an important part of the overall profile of US government exchanges. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm sure that in the audience today, there are personnel from foreign militaries uh, may be present as part of uh, military to military exchange programs. Um, uh, the budget for military to military exchanges uh, is, uh, I think, equal to the uh, civilian military exchange budget. And there's a great book on the soft power coming uh, from these programs uh, by Carol Atkinson, uh, a former colleague of mine from USC. Uh, finally, I don't think we should underestimate the reach of uh, the military in US international broadcasting. Uh, the Armed Forces uh, Network has been um, inc incredibly significant in places where it can be heard. Uh, when I've talked to people who grew up in West Germany, who grew up in South Korea, and uh, tried to get an idea from them about how they formed positive uh, ideas about the United States and its culture, they're much more likely, I found, to credit Armed Forces Network than Voice of America. And when I've asked them why, they say, well, because the AFN broadcasts weren't for me. And so I thought they were much more credible. And I thought that they were playing the real music that Americans like, not some kind of compromise music that the government had, uh, was, was sharing uh, for a foreign audience. I think that this is the powerful effect of uh, eavesdropping, that you're more likely to believe something you're not meant to hear than a message that's directly targeted to you. Is the military part of American soft power? Well, it certainly is sometimes. And if you have ever spoken to uh, foreign recipients of American assistance uh, during a disaster, for example, years later, people uh, remember and talk about positive assistance received in the darkest days of their community from uh, US military personnel. Um, I think when we get into some aspects of uh, American uh, military history, uh, especially counterinsurgency, but also moments when troops have been deployed side by side with civilians, you run into uh, a mixed bag of stories. And here I want to uh, get personal and speak about an experience of my own father during World War II as an example. So when dad was about 12, the London Blitz was going on uh, and um, uh, it had um, all started up again with um, the V2 uh, and V1 rockets coming over. Uh, so 
um, uh, it was hard to get food in London, and he began growing potatoes on uh, a little allotment to supplement the family's um, food. Uh, it would be, I think, 1940. Uh, 44, he harvested potatoes, had, um, uh, was wheeling them home, about 12 pounds of potatoes, in a baby carriage. And uh, an American truck came racing around the corner uh, as he was crossing the street. He jumped out of the way, but the truck hit the baby carriage and squashed his potatoes. Now, I'm reporting this to you because his personal experience meant that he had a... Um, a grudge against the United States government, which lasted for about 30 years, and was only overcome when he personally came to the United States and realized that actually Americans were considerate and genuinely friendly, and uh, he um, thought, well, maybe he shouldn't have uh, felt he shouldn't have carried that resentment for quite so long. He didn't talk about the uh, problem until he'd actually gotten over it, but I was certainly aware of his attitude towards the uh, United States as a, um, when I was growing up. Uh, the problem is that you know, that's a relatively minor um, personal experience of the US military. Imagine if the, there'd have been an accidental drone bombing on a family wedding. Those sorts of things uh, are a stay with people for a long, long time. And the country doesn't have the resources to bring everybody over to see for themselves, to have positive personal contact. And so part of w what I think we have to focus on is uh, to understand the power in personal uh, contacts, whether for uh, the positive or for the negative. Some historical milestones. Well, great moments in the public diplomacy profile or soft power profile of the US military. Uh, I think the tour of the Great White Fleet uh, in um, 1908, 1909 is a tremendous uh, moment of uh, welcoming US power to the world stage, a very impressive moment, made more impressive by the way in which uh, the US Navy provided relief at the Messina earthquake in Italy in 1909. Uh, during World War I, uh, the military was integrated into the national communication structure, the Committee uh, for Public Information, run by George Creel. Uh, however, relationship between the War Department and CPI wasn't uh, particularly uh, warm. There's a, a rivalry within that. One of the successes, however, were individual military officers, especially people who came from uh, foreign language communities, uh, hyphenate communities within the US, going back to uh, their family's country of origin and uh, serving as speakers. Uh, the person on the screen is Fiorello LaGuardia, um, future mayor of New York City, uh, who was a very effective uh, speaker and, uh, on behalf of the United States in uh, Italy. Uh, during World War II, uh, there was an understanding that American personnel would be ambassadors for the country, and um, there's a whole host of training materials now available to see uh, how uh, this preparation was worked. One of the things that Americans were asked not to do in the UK was boast, uh, particularly don't tell uh, one of the instructions in um, this uh, instruction manual for servicemen in Britain is don't tell Americans, don't tell British people what Americans regularly eat. Uh, because they won't believe you. They won't believe it's possible to eat meat three times a day in the United States. They'll just think that's uh, American bragging. Uh, during the occupations following World War II, there was a special role for the American military, both supervising the reconstruction of Germany and Japan and as a point of contact with uh, civilians in those, uh, in those countries. Uh, I think... Uh, it was the, um, probably the greatest military diplomat, uh, President Eisenhower, who brought a sensibility about the need to be 
uh, careful around international communication, uh, who brought a sensibility towards what he called the psychological factor into uh, US government as never before. Um, uh, as president, uh, Eisenhower initiated, um, well, he, he reformed American public diplomacy. He created the United States Information Agency. Uh, he uh, ran, sponsored that agency with insights gathered from the battlefield. And he initiated some great public diplomacy programs, such as People-to-People uh, -people International, which at the end of the Eisenhower period became an, uh, an NGO in its own right. During the conflict in Vietnam, there was uh, the creation of a joint United States Public Affairs Office, just POW, as uh, an experiment in integrated public diplomacy, blending work of the USIA with Defense Department and uh, other agencies. Uh, the man who held this together was the wonderful Barry Zorthian, uh, a, um, a ama truly amazing uh, communicator um, who um, uh, accomplished uh, a lot in very difficult circumstances. Uh, also with uh, the US military, we have uh, unintended consequences. Always when you're communicating, there are things you don't expect. Uh, the Americanization of, of Emily uh, is a movie uh, from the 1960s depicting the cultural impact of the United States on uh, young British girls, <laughs> but it's, it's there as a, a stand-in for a wider issue. Uh, other unintended consequences. Somebody in the US military had, in Japan after World War II had the great idea that Japan needed to understand competition. And a great way of teaching competition would be to put game shows on the um, uh, Japanese radio. So uh, unintended consequence of this is, of course, the Japanese game show. Uh, a scene here where this poor young woman's in a, a, a part of a game show is in a perspex box being rolled around by an, a hungry bear. So uh, you never know where your ideas for public engagement are going to lead. Uh, the military has had a particularly important role in public diplomacy since 9-11. Um, I think that uh, Colin Powell was able to bring uh, his uh, insights from his military career into the State Department and uh, played a really important role in uh, moving the State Department into the information age. I was really shocked that until Powell said that every um, embassy needed to have a website. Uh, a lot of US embassies hadn't even bothered to have websites. And I'm not talking here about uh, somewhere like, uh, you know, Windhoek, Namibia. Um, the US embassy Stockholm didn't have a website when uh, Powell became uh, Secretary of State. Uh, he also insisted that every um, diplomat carry, a, carry a, a, a cell phone, which was not the, uh, not the case uh, previous to that. Um, the Department of State um, developed machinery in public diplomacy, but uh, at the point uh, that 9-11 happened, it was still in flux. USIA had just been merged into uh, the Department of State, and things weren't working especially well. Uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Charlotte Beers, um, didn't really have the budget to do the things she needed to do post 9-11. And so she allowed and invited the Department of Defense to take on a number of key tasks. Uh, there's also tremendously significant messaging work done by the regional combat commands at this time. Uh, when AFRICOM is stood up in the later, when is it, it's about 2008, um, uh, public diplomacy is actually included as the chief, uh, one of the chief responsibilities of that command. Uh, we're used to uh, the military filling public diplomacy roles in provincial reconstruction teams, and I think we'll be hearing about that this afternoon. Um, by 2008, the role of the military in delivering US public diplomacy had become so extensive that the analyst Matthew Armstrong remarked, public diplomacy 
wears combat boots, or for the United States, public diplomacy wears combat boots. From this high water mark, a number of administrators in the Department of Defense, most especially Secretary Gates, worked to walk back the military's role and increase the presence of the State Department in managing and directing public diplomacy. But there are still some uh, special uh, activities happening, especially in the uh, online space. And now, our current moment of crisis. What do I see going on right now? Well, the first thing I would say is that today, the media is in crisis. Media has been weaponized around the world, uh, both by government and by hostile factions. Also, part of our moment of crisis is a technological transition. As a historian, I believe that technological transitions in news media are always disruptive to international affairs. In fact, the major crises of the 20th century include within their origin a neglected dimension of media disruption. Part of the reason things went wrong on the eve of the First World War was the unrestrained impact of the popular press. Part of the problem that led to the Second World War was the fact that large populations could be stirred up by the radio, newsreel, and new forms of communication. And don't take my word for it, Adolf Hitler himself said that without the radio and newsreel, there would be no victory for National Socialism in Germany. And who am I to argue with him? I think the Cold War was made worse by uh, new and emerging technologies, particularly uh, disruption that can be tied to uh, television at particular moments in the crisis. So uh, right now, I think that it's very dangerous that we are losing trust in our media, that our, uh, uh, our media are so disrupted by the arrival of social media. I think of it, in fact, as being like a new virus to which we have yet to uh, develop uh, an immunity. We are destabilized by this new presence in our midst. The body politic needs to develop resistance. As it developed resistance to uh, things they read in the papers, as it came to use radio and, and film and television for positive uh, diplomatic exchanges and for balance in international affairs. For our moment of crisis, we find a politics in crisis. Problems in the world today are too big for any single actor to solve. Many countries have looked towards strong men as a shortcut or reassuring solution. And we are backing away uh, from the kind of cooperation necessary to resolve these problems. We see political gridlock in uh, many countries. Many countries have unprecedented levels of uh, inter-party strife. Our diplomacy is in crisis because diplomats themselves have lost credibility, partly because you can get your news from all kinds of other people, uh, why trust a foreign diplomat when you can hear from somebody in your exact demographic group online? And we see the public as a central factor in absolutely everything. And the centrality of the public has transparently been exploited by the strategic rivals of the United States. And that's why I want to finish by talking about the link between reputation and security. Reputation and security are clearly deeply connected in the world today. And you just look at the way in which assaults on our reputation are targeting particular elements that then uh, attack or undermine parts of our security. I'm thinking particularly here of hostile messaging designed to destabilize alliances. In, uh, media of Russian origin, no alliance is represented as being genuine. Um, uh, alliances are always uh, bogus and in the process of falling apart. 
we also see attacks on the image of individual allies, and not the allies we would uh, imagine to be uh, vulnerable to attack from outside. A major target of Kremlin media is um, Scandinavia. Why? Because it has such a positive reputation. Uh, so there is a, a, a persistent story coming from Russia that uh, Scandinavia is amidst of uh, corruption and a den of child molestation. And uh, these stories are believed and are of deep concern to uh, governments of uh, Denmark and um, Norway and Sweden. Uh, divisions are being accentuated we are seeing the rise of non-cooperative models of government and hostile leadership styles. And uh, it's always possible to highlight international setbacks as somehow being typical of the era. I see a great need right now to work to rebuild the credibility of communication and to think of reputation and the preservation of reputation as being an essential part of our security. How do we gain security? Uh, in the UK, uh, maybe it would be four years ago now, there was a report that, that suggested what was called a fusion doctrine. And this was a linkage between soft power, economic stability, uh, public diplomacy, and the traditional apparatuses of security, saying these are all interconnected and a uh, problem with one can be multiplied, uh, so uh, we need to attend to all these elements of our power. I think it's an effective way of framing uh, public diplomacy as part of reputational security because the treasury departments around the world understand the significance of security whereas they've come to think of soft power as being sprinkles on top of a cake, literally the decorations on the cake of the national presence in the world. We have to understand our reputation can help, but it also can hurt. How do we cultivate or what elements in our reputation do we focus on? Well, being relevant is essential. And I don't think that's much of a problem for the United States, which is relevant uh, in people's lives for all sorts of reasons. But smaller countries have to seek out the relevance of their country and their culture to the world if they want a good reputation. We know from uh, the analysis, deep analysis of public opinion around the world, that it helps if you're a rich country, it helps if you are a strong country. But the most important, runaway most important factor in being admired by the rest of the world is being seen as to be a good country, to be relevant in good ways, to be the source of good uh, elements in the uh, collective well-being. To be credible, well, credible communication needs not just one super credible Walter Cronkite to tell you what's credible, it needs many, many sources over time to build up a picture of the reality. And that means that the Department of Defense needs to be part of the communication because it's such an important voice for the United States in the world. A path to American reputational security needs DOD support. The military is very credible at home and I think messages coming from military sources about the need for particular behaviors to enhance the international uh, reputation of the United States will be taken seriously within the United States, whereas messages from other portions of government, other voices within the federal uh, government will not be taken seriously. I think especially uh, messages from the legislative branch are uh, not taken seriously by uh, the US public at the moment. The other thing that I want to suggest is that we may need to help our allies develop and enhance their reputational security. And perhaps there's a, a concept here of collective reputational security. And I know from my own uh, uh, work as a, uh, a consultant how uh, many allied countries are seeking to improve their international image, to address 
um, their own uh, domestic reputational problems, and I think assisting that should be seen as a good investment for um, uh, US uh, uh, taxpayer money. We cannot afford to have weak links in our reputation or the reputation of our allies, either at home or abroad. So my conclusion is what does this mean to me? Well, uh, with the me here being not me personally, but what does it mean? I should say, what does it mean to you? Uh, we need our senior commanders uh, and military educators to stress the value of protecting the reputation of the United States. We need continued support for the Department of Defense to the Department uh, of State. The State Department needs these messages, as have been received from people like uh, 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 Mullen and people like Secretary Gates, uh, that uh, uh, have stressed the need for leadership from the Department of State in public diplomacy and the value of the public diplomacy role. For the junior officers, for the, the, the people here uh, as midshipmen, we need you to hold your personnel in your careers to high, even the highest standards in their interaction with foreign publics. As a historian, I have seen so much trouble coming out of a single drunk naval rating, a single uh, bad driver uh, from a military base can undo all kinds of long-term uh, diplomatic efforts. And that's why training should be uh, directed towards uh, enhancing reputation, training for reputational security. I think we need uh, mutual education so we understand one another better and come to uh, see the attitudes underpinning uh, our, our behaviors. But the bottom line is that to be admirable in the world, the United States needs to have an admirable reality at home. And looking at public opinion, I have to say the world is watching division within the United States and is concerned by it. The US has dropped from being the most admired country to being, at the moment, about number 10. But in uh, admiration for people and admiration for politics, it's down at number 18. It's still ahead of Russia and China, but there's a lot of European countries and some Asian countries that are more admired in terms of their people. And um, uh, I think that's, that's a problem. When President Eisenhower saw this kind of slippage in admiration for the United States, when President Kennedy saw this and understood the linkage between that slippage in admiration and global knowledge of American race relations and problems in American race relations, those two presidents made it a priority to uh, address um, uh, problems in uh, the area of civil rights in the United States. And today we need the military to be part of a voice for that kind of uh, change and to say that a bad reputation in the United States or negative perceptions of this uh, domestic dimension in American politics is a problem in international security. It makes easy stories uh, for our strategic adversaries. Um, on the positive side, I think hospitality within the United States, encouraging communities to welcome foreigners, to take care of foreign visitors, uh, this pays dividends in uh, the long term and is another place where uh, uh, words of encouragement from military leaders can make a difference. My final thought for you is that diplomacy may be something you associate with people in striped pants at cocktail parties in faraway embassies. But the reality is, in the 21st century, diplomacy is everyone's job. And it's a pleasure to be in an institution that's making a difference in the world. I want to thank the Academy 
So when you're from Los Angeles and you say, I want to thank the Academy, it always sounds a little funny. But I want to thank the Academy for inviting me here, the Naval Institute for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be part of this special, remarkable conference today, and I look forward to discussions. Um, Dr. Cull, Pete Daly, I'm going to jump in and make an icebreaker sure. question here. Thank you for your remarks. Um, in, in this realm of reputation, what is your advice to the U.S. military on this account? With the extreme stakes that are now at play in politics in the United States, uh, you've mentioned the crisis in media, what can the military do to not become that irresistible solution? People continue to reach to the military sure. and use the military as a prop or try to use the military to prop up their point of view. And the military has tried very hard to maintain an apolitical stance. Um, I think we've mostly succeeded, but the pressure is overwhelming. What would be your advice to military personnel, given those almost irresistible pressures to politicize the military? I, well, I think um, that a lot of leadership needs to come from the Secretary of Defense level. And the moments when Secretaries of Defense have pushed back against the um, overuse of the military in communications have been important moments. Um, if I could say just one thing that needs to change, it would be in the civilian leadership. I think it is unacceptable that the post of Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs has, over the last 20 years, been vacant 40% of the time. That is unacceptable, and the military or, or, or leadership need to push back and say, that we need to have interlocutors for this important public role for thinking about the psychological factor in world affairs. You can't have that seat empty. Otherwise, who are you going to talk to if there's nobody sitting in the chair, uh, if there's nobody who has authority to uh, provide uh, leadership in this dimension? So um, uh, 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 that's, what I, that's the message that I would want to send, is look, let's have somebody in the chair. Um, to uh, talk to, to work with, to be part of a partnership. It is really hard to have a partnership in building the reputation for the United States when uh, White Houses of either political color have failed to nominate uh, somebody for, for that role, when they have not made it a genuine priority. And sure, presidents say, oh, it's super important. The power of our example is more important than the example of our power was uh, the line in uh, the current president's inaugural address. Um, but, um, you know, the actually nominating somebody is, is important. Uh, Peter, is that okay as an answer? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so first question from the screen, is the military's role in diplomacy too influential in re recent years? Uh, I think that, um, that the position taken by Secretary Gates um, suggests that there's a recognition that the military has been asked to do uh, too much. The problem is not that the military is doing too much, it's that uh, the uh, civilian uh, side has been doing too little. And uh, part of this was to do with um, diplomats not being prepared to play some of the roles uh, in provincial reconstruction teams, for example, and uh, not wanting to uh, be in harm's way. Uh, and um, you know, all kinds of questions, I think, emerge from uh, that situation. So I would feel that the military has been doing uh, too much, uh, but not necessarily that the military should simply step back but that the civilian side of things needs to be able to step forward, and that needs an attitude, it needs a uh, budget, but my bottom line is it needs leadership. Uh, second question, I called social media a virus. Does the medium of social media have any beneficial uh, potential with respect to foreign policy? Uh, well, I think it, it does. I think that the transparency uh, provided by social media is positive, 
but with any medium, we need to learn how to read it. We have to be literate. We have to uh, develop good habits of uh, looking behind the message to think, well, who is communicating this with us? What might their agenda be? And uh, one of the most important positions to take is to think, do I retweet this? Do I pass it on? Do I repost this? Um, the scholar Nina Yankovic has said, we've learned to do social distancing in our face-to-face -face encounters. Now's the time to develop habits of information distancing in our virtual encounters. To think, do I want to pass this on, or am I making the world a worse place by repeating a rumor? Uh, during World War II, there was tremendous concern about uh, people repeating rumors. And you, know, you remember the, the, um, one of the techniques used was to uh, undermine the reputation of individuals who repeat rumors and make it a, a socially undesirable thing to do, to be re repeating a silly story. The reason people retweet something salacious online is because they want to be more respected. They want to be more admired. So uh, I think um, uh, not applauding, not liking uh, that kind of material, as we all develop those habits, it will allow the worst of social media to be uh, discouraged, the best of social media to be encouraged. Uh, next question. What has been the net effect of globalization on diplomacy? Is it good or bad? Um, well, I just see globalization as being our reality. I, I don't think we have much uh, choice in it. Um, to me, the positive aspect of globalization is the way in which it opens the opportunity for large-scale collaboration. Because when the problems in the world are too big for any individual country to fix, the only way we're going to move forward is through partnership. So as the problems are globalized, so the solutions have to be globalized. And I think, final question, Peter? OK. How does the appointment of retired military officers as ambassadors affect the balance between the military and the Department of State? And you know, that's one that I have never thought about. Uh, so, um, uh, but I, you know, I, uh, I would say that it's not a major problem that diplomats complain to me about. When we've had a few drinks and it's late at night, uh, the ambassadors that they complain about are the people who come in with business, not the people from business uh, who are major campaign donors, not the military who have a reputation for being, you'll be glad to know, very, very well educated about world affairs. And I think a good foundation at Annapolis uh, is part of that success story. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank it's been you, great Jeff to be Powell. here today. Dr. Cole, we thank you for participating, coming all the way out from the left coast, west coast, to uh, talk with us today. And uh, I learned a lot in your remarks. I think we all did. We have two Naval Institute Press books. One is A Quiet Cadence, written by Mark Trainer, a USNA grad about Vietnam. And another, Herndon Climb, Requires No Explanation to a Naval Academy audience, written by Admiral McNeil and Scott Tomaszewski. Oh, thank you so thank much. Thank you very, very much. Kind. Thank you.